Um, it's also Passover. It came late this year. And uh, Passover, I'm sure most of you know about Passover. Passover is a celebration of the, of the story of the exodus out of Israel from bondage of the Pharaoh to, to what became the Promised Land. And I really wonder if the Pharaoh had just let the people go right away, you know, like the first time Moses asked him to let his people go, he could have avoided all those ten plagues. And I bet you later he was sorry he had let them go after those ten plagues. But it is a wonderful time for being around a, a Passover Seder table. If you ever get a chance to do a Seder, um, do it, because it's a wonderful story and it's a great celebration. Food's not bad either. <laughs> My yoga teacher told this story that I'm going to share with you today. It's about a farmer somewhere in Asia who had a water buffalo that he used to help him keep his rice paddies um, well maintained. He was kind to the animal. He treated it gently. He valued the animal greatly. And the animal never gave him any trouble at all. But one day, the farmer was guiding the tiller through the rice paddies when the water buffalo, for no apparent reason, just began to run off. He just ran away. And the poor farmer is holding on to the reins, holding on on the back of the tiller, and just getting this terrible bumpy ride till finally he falls down and gets muddy and bruised and battered, and he's covered with dirt and hurt and bruised, and all of a sudden the water buffalo just stops for no apparent reason. Well, there's a moral to the story. Sometimes it's good to let go of your water buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that all of us in some way can relate to that story, right? And we've all got some water buffaloes in our, we had some water buffaloes in our lives. And when I think about this story, I think about the fact that when we try to hold on too tightly to something, it often ends up injuring us. But when we let go, we find a space for ease and for peace. And so this little story, this very simple little story, has so many different meanings to it. So many different ways in which we can interpret it. And ever since I heard this story, I've been playing with it in my head and seeing all the ways in which I've had my own water buffaloes ongoing in my life. The water buffalo becomes a symbol for that which we try to hold on to. Physically, a water buffalo is one of the largest and most powerful of all the ruminants. They stand nearly six feet tall. They have split hooves so they can walk in the mud and they are incredibly powerful. They provide the muscle for farming in a lot of the Asian countries in the same way that oxen have served as beasts of burden in so many Western places, as well as in the East as well. The first Sunday in April, Reverend Josh talked about Wu Wei, about doing and non-doing. Well, today I'm going to be talking about holding on and letting go. But during the month of April, he also talked about uh, childlike and childish, and he talked about knowing and not knowing. And all of the different aspects of the Tao have to do with what are seeming opposites, apparent opposites. So, but the Tao looks to the natural world as a guide for the way we live life. And non-action in the way sense does not mean laziness, but it rather means resting either before or after an action. So as we look at the, the Tao and we look at Western life, so often what we seem to, to prize in the Western world is hard work, struggle, effort, and those seem to be great virtues. Sometimes people have said to me, I worked 80 hours last week. Like it was, you know, I worked 80 hours last week and I have to look at them and go, you're crazy. Why would you work 80 hours? <laughs> But it's a virtue to do all this work, 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 right? So we forget in that the balance of action and non-action, of holding on, letting go, of the yin-yang, and that apparent seeming opposites. When we think of the yin-yang and the, the symbol of the Tao, it's a big circle. 
and half of the circle looks like this and the other half looks like this and they fit together and one side is dark and one side is light. The light side has a dark dot and the dark side has a light dot to represent the oneness and the wholeness of life. That there is light and there is darkness and there is struggle and there is ease and there is doing and there is non-doing. And there is, you know, light, I said light and darkness. So it's, you get it, I'm sure you get it by now. So everything has these yin and yang as aspects. Shadow can't exist without light, right? We need both. It isn't just one or the other. Either of those aspects may manifest more strongly from time to time in a particular object or in a particular situation, depending on the criterion of that observation. But the yin yang shows a balance. It shows a balance between those two opposites with a portion of the opposite element in each one. So even male and female, you know, the yin yang, it's the yin energy, female, yang, yang energy, male energy, and yet there's also the male and the female and the female and the male. Oneness, wholeness. This is what we teach in Science of Mind. That it is all that is, not just the good, good stuff, but all that is that is wrapped up in the idea of the one. So when we look at the story of the water buffalo, we can think of so many ways in which that buffalo can characterize some experiences in our own lives. Our minds run away with us, right? I call it the squirrel cage, some people call it the committee, some people call it monkey chatter. Sometimes we have a herd of buffaloes running away. But all of that is part of this idea that we allow sometimes something to bottle up, store up so much in our own mind that it builds up into something overwhelming, overpowering, that pulls us away and causes us personal harm. I saw a t-shirt that says something about, I love drama. <laughs> He's covering it up right now. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I hope you get an Oscar. <laughs> but the idea, we build up our own traumas in our mind, don't we? I mean, just a simple one. Um, we have to get up early in the morning because we have an important interview, right? So we're in bed, and what are we doing in bed? We're going, oh, and gee, I can't sleep. I have to get up at 5 o'clock. What time is it? Oh, it's 2.30. Oh, no, I have two and a half hours of sleep. How am I ever going to get up in the morning and be energized for this interview? And if I don't get the, the job, then I'm not going to make any money. And if I don't make any money, my family will starve and will be on this. You get it, right? Water buffalo, man, it's just running you ragged, right? So we have to learn how to deal with those things in a way that allows us to calm down, allows us to get a peaceful night's sleep. Here's another one sometimes we store up. Anybody ever said something like, I am never going to eat chocolate again. <laughs> and suddenly, at midnight, you find yourself in front of the pantry devouring a Hershey bar, right? <laughs> There's no way for us to put such rigid rules on ourselves that we stop everything we enjoy doing because the water buffalo eventually is going to get you and you're going to eat the chocolate bar. <laughs> right? That's why our grandparents always said to us, everything in moderation, dear. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, I'm telling you now, I'm a grandma. Everything in moderation. <laughs> <laughs> So we may all be practitioners of science and mind, and I know that we are, and we're all learning at different stages of development in, in this wonderful teaching that really does allow us to, to have some control over our thoughts. And Ernest Holmes says, the trained mind is always more powerful than the untrained mind. And so we need tools in order to, to do that. Now a water buffalo, I want to get a little bit more into this side of things before I get into the good stuff about how, how we make this different, how we manage our water buffaloes. A water buffalo is a ruminant. How many of you know what a ruminant is? Okay, a ruminant is like a cow. They eat grassy food, they chew it, they swallow it, but it kind of goes into a side stomach so that it can come up, back up again and they chew it again. That's why they call it chewing their cud. And that's kind of like, oh, good. That's what we do with our thoughts when we ruminate. We bring them back <coughs> up again, right? Oh, here it is again. But we do that because we are, again, allowing that water buffalo to carry us off 
into places with our thoughts where we probably don't really want to go. The Tao says, wild winds never last all morning, and fierce rains never last all day. So even when we're having scary, difficult, fearful thoughts, angry thoughts, they never last for long if we allow them to pass through us rather than holding on and resisting them, right? So our thoughts can be very powerful when we give them power. They can mean very little unless we give them meaning, right? We give power to our thoughts. We give meaning to our thoughts. Our thoughts are just our thoughts until we give them power or meaning. What thoughts are we giving power to? What thoughts are we giving meaning to? You're walking down the street one day and you see somebody that you just really like and they're coming up the other way and you walk by and you say hi and you just keep on walking and you go, oh, they must not like me. They must be mad at me. What did I do wrong? My oh, gosh, they always say hello. It never occurs to us that they might be working on their own water buffalo at the time and they didn't even see you. So we, we make meaning out of things and, and sometimes the way we do that, the way we interpret things, can be very negative when we find out later, oh, you know, I just lost my best friend and I was just off in some other space. I'm sorry I didn't see you. We find out that all of those thoughts we were having are just thoughts. We made it up. But we allowed something to get a hold of us and carry us away. So when we learn that uncomfortable thoughts pass more quickly when we just allow them to be, then when we try to hold them back or hold on to them, then we are beginning to understand what it means to let go of thoughts, to let go of the reins and just let the buffalo run and wear himself out until he stops. We can get pretty beat up inside when we don't do that sometimes, right? And I know that there are a lot of things that we may think about that do beat us up inside. We do beat ourselves up, things that we haven't forgiven ourselves for things that we have interpreted incorrectly and allowed ourselves to feel hurt by, punished by. Sometimes when the water buffalo is in the form of emotions and they run away with us, they can really get us pretty beat up. Anger, so many times people who practice science of mind think of anger as something really bad. We shouldn't be angry. And so we store it all up inside, right? Because we don't want to be angry, so we put on a smile. How are you? I'm fine. I'm just fine. And then some little thing triggers us and off we go, like Vesuvius. Now I'm not saying all of us do that because some of us have learned in our practice how to deal with that. But I think anger has to have a place, an outlet that's safe for us to let go. It's important for us to be able to have that. For me, one of the things that I do when I really want to work out some anger, some things that I'm thinking about, I read. I am the best reader when I'm out about something. I just get out there and I pull those darn weeds and I have this nice garden when I'm done. But, and I feel really good because I've let go. I haven't really harmed anything but the weeds. They go in the recycle bin and I go, whew, and go take a shower and wash it off. So it's, it's a, a technique I use that's my own personal way of sometimes dealing with anger. But trying to control our emotions to that point can mean that we can be like a Vesuvius, right? We can deny our feelings, we can stuff our feelings, we can compartmentalize our feelings. Yesterday on public radio in the afternoon, I don't know if it was the moth, but it was one of those programs where people tell stories. And a young man was talking about how his mom taught him to deal with anger when he was a boy. And he said, my mom told me that when I had angry feelings or ang you know, difficult feelings, I should just put them in a box, an imaginary box, and then take that box and put them in a cabinet and just store them in that cabinet and shut the door on them. And he said, and I was only about 10 or 11 when she told me that, and, she, and he said one of our relatives came over one day and they started to open up this one cabinet door and I started saying, don't open it, don't open it, because in his mind he had put all his bad feelings up in that cabinet door. Not a very healthy way to deal with feelings, right? Not a very healthy way, instead of allowing them just flow through. When we have, when we try to do that, we are causing ourselves harm. So we have to learn how to recognize our emotions. 
We have to understand that we all have emotions. They're natural and normal things that we all experience in our own lives. I've been practicing mindful meditation for some time, mindfulness meditation for some time. And if you know, we've been doing it here once a month on Thursdays. We have a little practice and we talk about mindful living and mindful life. And what I've found with this very simple technique is that just by simply focusing on the breath, it doesn't cost a penny. You don't really have to go anywhere to learn how to do that. We naturally breathe. But by focusing on the breath, breathing in and breathing out, and focusing only on that, breathing in, breathing out, or like the Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, I breathe in, I calm my body, I breathe out, I smile. Some kind of a simple technique to bring us to the present moment, to allow us to just simply <coughs> focus on the breath. We'll still have thoughts flowing through our head. They never really go away, and I've never really been able to say, oh, I turn my mind into a blank canvas when I meditate, I think of nothing. <laughs> Maybe some of you do. I don't know, and if you do, bless you. <laughs> But instead, to just allow the thoughts to flow by like they would on the top of the water and go back to the breath, go back to the breath, go back to the breath. I was watching a TED Talk. I've been following a project that Stanford University has been doing for a number of years on compassion. And they, um, on their newsletter, had a, um, an article about this woman that's been doing a lot of work with mindful breathing. She's been working with veterans, teaching PTSD veterans when they come back how to breathe, how to do breathing practices so they can sleep at night and so they can be less uh, hyper alert and have fewer symptoms of PTSD. And what she has learned is through the work that they've done, the research they've done, is that because our breath has so much to do with the way our state of mind is, when we're agitated, we breathe with very shallow breathing. When we're relaxed, we breathe more deeply. And when we focus on our breath, we can breathe even more deeply. And what she has done is taught these veterans breathing techniques that have been so powerful that as they've followed them over three years now, they have found that this, still, this process still works, that these veterans are now able to sleep at night without drugs. They're able to manage better their feelings and their emotions simply by teaching the breath. What they've learned is that if we breathe in a little shorter breath on the in-breath and a little longer breath on the out-breath, and the in-breath, the heart rate goes up a little. The out-breath, the heart calms down. So if we learn to breathe so that the in-breath is a little shorter and the out-breath is longer, that it allows us to calm down. She was saying, you know, you can't really, like Rachel was saying in her beautiful meditation, you can't just tell somebody let go or calm down. Because most of the time, tell them to let go, and, you know, calm down. I'm calm, I'm calm. But rather, when you teach them how to breathe so that they can calm themselves, now they have control. Now they have power over their thoughts and their feelings. When the uncomfortable feelings come up in a mindful meditation, and we recognize the uncomfortable feelings, we can say to ourselves, they're already here, the feelings. They're already here. Let me feel them. Let me feel them. Allowing them to flow through rather than stuffing them and holding them back. Because stuffing them and holding them back just causes us more harm, or even others, more harm. So we learn to recognize our emotions, and we learn to allow them to move through us. It's a simple thing to just simply take time to focus on the breath. I have a little app on my phone. It's called Centering Prayer. You can get it online. It's, I think it's free at the App Store. And it also has a few um, sample prayers. And it has little gong sounds, different kinds of sounds. And you can set the timer. And so I mine, mine is set for three minutes. And so during the day, I take what I call three-minute breathing spaces. I just take a little time out to be still. My little gong rings, and I go into the silence and do my breathing gong rings again, and it's always too soon. <laughs> and I just find that by doing that during the day, it helps my day go more easily. I've been learning these techniques for a couple of years now, and they are so simple, and it seems like, 
well, you're a minister, you should know this. And I probably have said that to myself. But I've never really involved myself in the practice like I have over these last few years. And the reason I started it was because of the loss of my son. I was feeling as though I had this cloud of gray fog in front of me all the time. <coughs> because there was still so much unresolved grief over his loss of now five years. And I found with these techniques and practices, I have my clarity back. The fog is gone because I'm able to use this simple breathing technique. You all know how much I love Hawaii. And the word aloha itself, ha, means breath. Ha means breath. And aloha means to breathe together, to breathe as one. That's what the word really means. Many indigenous cultures know the value of the breath. And it's the one thing we've been freely given. It's the thing that we all have. And it's portable and it's free. 